What is it exactly? Who knows? But we do know one or two things. We also know that good prose is a crucial part of it. Good prose can mean good dialogue, good descriptions like trees, people, bustling cities, good anything that has to do with words. Of course, it's not that simple. If it were, then we won't be talking about how to write good prose. That said, I think these practical tips will help you discipline your prose. First thing to watch out for is well-paced dialogue. I've often found that some dialogue interactions go at a breakneck speed while others drag on and on. I habitually like to explore the small ways the characters' bodies jerk in response to what has been said to them. The swivel of the eyes in the socket, the pose, and whether it's sagging to indicate defeat or gorged to indicate a triumphant moment. Other basic functions like biting the lips, crossing arms, or tabbing the legs are also things I like to do. None of these things are generic by the way because they can be used as a method to slow down the dialogue interaction and two because that's how our bodies work. If you're anxious, your legs tap the floor, you bite your lips, and you start sweating. If you're angry, you cross your arms, ready to swing at the first mm -mm, mother. In the following example, Nicole is our protagonist. She's a naughty one and has a dog that constantly leaves dumps on the next family's lawn. The mother of that family visits Nicole for the fifth day in a row and whines about the dog shitting in her lawn. Let's call the woman visits Nicole Mrs. Blowfart. Or whatever, anyway. Nicole blasted the TV volume after a tiring day of house chores. She tuned into the evening news and her back enjoyed loving the sofa. In fact, she loved nothing more than the sofa. Not even her husband, who has daily been proposing needles to get him to work. The reporters viewed the usual dose of people dying, then some weather reporting came in a few minutes later, and then the rest of the evening programs followed. Soon enough, after the sofa had swallowed her, she was watching the scrolling images without blinking. She didn't care about how my nominee it was, though. She loved nothing more than the sofa. The doorbell rang and Nicole stood thinking about grabbing a kitchen knife. She knew who was standing on the other side. Yesterday, albeit six minutes earlier, the doorbell had rang, and so it rang today. She twisted the doorknob. Mrs. Blow was standing with crossed arms. I see your dog has visited our lawn, she said as her unclipped hair swept in the windy breeze. Mrs. Blowfart's face had no makeup, and so the black dots on her forehead were on display for everyone. Nicole reeled back, a potent stench had slapped her nose. Mrs. Blowfart's signature smelly mouth. Nicole gripped her waist with one hand and folded the other over her mouth. I apologize, Mrs. Bloom. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Nicole wasn't any better at acting than the extras in the background of movies, no better than the cars that were driving by, the distant moves, or the cackles of the children playing on the other side of the road. Don't apologize, she said. I'll also make sure my dog doesn't come to you. Your lawn. Have a nice day, Mrs. Nicole. She shambled away, her hair still blowing like a raging storm. Nicole couldn't care less, so she went back to snuggling her sofa. The, this isn't perfect, okay? But since I've written it in 20 minutes, I deserve some slack. Still, practice what you preach. I fill in the gaps with the body nuances of the characters. Nicole grips her waist like a sassy teenager who couldn't care less. Mrs. Blowfart's hands were crossed, her hair was unclipped, her face had no makeup, and her breath smelled like a bum. She obviously woke up, so the dump and jogged straight to Nicole's door. I say Mrs. Blowfart's signature smelly mouth so as to tell the reader it's a routine thing, every day like a 9 to 5 job. All of these things act to do two benefits. First, they give subtext information, and second, because there are things to rest in between major dialogue bits, the reader has room to take in what was said. Ultimately, by injecting good breaks in between dialogue bits, the reader and the scene are capable of going at a simultaneous pace, or at least something close to that. This is what the same scene would look like if the basin was made all sorts of wonky. The doorbell rang, and Nicole answered. I see your dog has visited our lawn again, said Mrs. Bloom, who stood clogging the door. I apologize, Mrs. Bloom. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again, said Nicole. Mrs. Bloom crossed her arms. Don't apologize. I'll also make sure my dog doesn't come to your lawn. Have a nice day, Mrs. Nicole. She shambled away as her hair blew in the air. Nicole didn't care much, so she went back to snuggling her sofa. The previous version isn't any better, but for a reader at least, it feels as though too much has been dropped at once in this version. A good balance must be struck. Moreover, as you can probably see by the first version, it's something I'm still struggling with. The second thing to watch out for is over or under writing. An over writer is someone who writes more letters than he does commas, meaning writing a 50,000 word manuscript and labeling it a short story. The rule of thumb for over writers is to go for 5 to 15 percent smaller manuscripts. This can be done in many ways, but the most effective, which I've learned through editing my money manuscripts, is to reduce adverbs and adjectives. Instead of writing she said scornfully, maybe write she is scorned, or my personal favorite, she said. One way to describe sex girl is her phone bag is jiggled with every shuffle. Her thighs as curved as a distant hill, her hovering booty craving to drop off, bouncing like a spring in bed, and her skin hugging her skirt caught the eyes like a sharp fish hook. She played with his nerves, causing a bulge of sweltering simmer to twitch behind the tight zipper of his blue cowboyish ocean blue jeans, and I'm sure you've already gassed out. Instead of writing all of that rubbish, for example, you could write her slinky body played with his nerves, causing jerks behind his zipper. It's much simpler, but that doesn't mean it's inferior. In fact, because of the simplicity, the reader now has plenty of willpower left to keep reading. That means by the time they 
the readers will power is drained given you have written efficiently you can convey a chapter's worth of more information another method is to kill most weasel words not the word most the reason is because well weasel words don't add to a sentence in most cases that is they can sometimes be quite useful some of the more famous ones at least the ones i found plague in my writing are just likely almost basically quite virtually somewhat and many many more An underwriter doesn't mean a writer who writes more fluff or less fluff, nor does it mean he or she should start writing more fluff, it just means adding more crucial details. For example, more scenes to flesh out the theme of the story or even better, a character. It can be a supporting character or the main character. The idea is to add more words to inject clarification. This will make your manuscript best resemble what you have initially envisioned it to be. Another way is to include a line or two about how bloody the conflict was, that is to say more descriptions, which is not different from saying add more fluff to your writing, but note it though. I'm for the sort of fluff that makes your writing sharper, not thicker or lengthier, just sharper. Enough to pierce the reader's skull with better word choice, better similes, better sentence construction, better overall. Fluff doesn't necessarily have to curse your reader with a case of drooling, but it can strengthen your writing like steroids do for bodybuilders. See what I did there? I wrote more fluff to explain fluff. That is to say, knowing your way around fluffing is a good way to inject 5 to 10% of raunchy goods into your novel. Noted though, one whose fluff is more than his content becomes a smelly fart. Do not when you fluff. Fluff is good like a teddy bear, but when one spends 15 minutes hugging a teddy bear, one must ask himself, am I so full of fluff I have become a bluff? See what I did there? I lingered with the fluffing. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. Now the question at hand is how can you know if you're an overwriter or an underwriter? I've concocted a simple test to teach you whether you're an underwriter or an overwriter. I call it the it's brand. It works like this. Go to the library and pick up It, written by Stephen King, my second all-time author. These are the steps you have to take. First, read it. Second, reread it. Third, try to see whether you are dying of boredom or you are ready for a third go. This is the idea. You know you're an overwriter if you can read it twice and say I'm ready for a third go. I just couldn't sit through the 100 to 200 thousand words that could have been chopped off. I've enjoyed my first read through. Give it a 4.5 out of 5 if you ask me. But this monstrosity is only for the sturdy among us. My my sister read it three times, looked me in the eye, got a cup of water, and said, A fourth go it is. I read one of her short stories once and it was 30,000 words. If I might rephrase, she is the one who said it was a short story and I was the fool who was tricked. So that's it. An overwriter is probably someone who cannot spot an overwritten manuscript and aren't bothered by reading an overwritten manuscript. Simply put, if you have never heard of overwriting, then you're probably an overwriter. If you want to do further research, I've compiled a list of authors who overwrite as well as others who underwrite. Overwriters include Stephen King, J.R.R. Tolkien, George Orwell, and pretty much any one before the dawn of 1900s. Those guys had a serious crush on the word rambling. Some underwriters include Ernest Hemingway, probably famous for his minimalist approach to writing. Other famous authors include J.K. Rowling, Charles Bukowski, Neil Gaiman, Toni Morrison, Agatha Christie, James Patterson, and countless more. Obviously, this is what I think after reading their works. Most of these writers, such as Neil Gaiman or J.K. Rowling, or even Agatha Christie, are sufficient writers, meaning most of these scenes don't feel all at once or too slow. They often strike a delicate balance. Adverbs or no adverbs? I'm of the opinion that language is language and no part of it is bad. It's simply about the way it's utilized. I will use the passive voice in order to explain my point, okay? Some people say that all passive voice ought to be creamified. And the thing is that many do their best to try and kill the passive voice. The crucial part to note is that many have been trying to kill the passive voice since before Shakespeare. I mean, what happened? If you tell a child to not run into a wall, I'm sure they'll figure out why after the first attempt. Millions of adults who have lived in all times literature has been a thing try to kill the silent, innocent voice. Why hasn't the passive voice died then? Steven Pinker, fabulous name by the way, is a cognitive psychologist, linguist, and a popular science fiction author. He says he's explaining why the passive voice has survived the war. There is an inherent problem baked into the design of language. The order of words in a sentence has to do two things at once. It's the code that English syntax uses to express who did what to whom. At the same time, it necessarily presents some bits of information to the reader before others, and thereby affects how the information is going to be absorbed. 
In particular, the early material in the sentence uh, refers to the sentence's topic, that it and naturally connects back to what's already reverberating in the reader's mind. In the metaphor of classic prose, it refers to the general direction in which the reader is looking. The later words in the sentence contain the sentence's focal point, what, it, it, what fact it is now conveying. Uh, in the metaphor, it's what the reader is supposed to now notice. Any prose that violates these principles, even if each sentence is clear, uh, will feel choppy or disjointed or incoherent. Uh, and that brings us to the passive. The passive is a workaround in English uh, for this inherent design limitation of the language. That is to say, your ass cannot violate hard-boiled sentence structure unless you use passive voice. Steven Pinker delves into more detail and explains it even further. I don't want to digress too much into it, but if you are interested, I will leave a link below. The same goes for adverbs in the sense that they serve a very crucial function. They have been around and therefore will be after we are all gone. If they are all killed by the angry mob, who is going to describe our verbs, huh? Who? Oh! The question does not point to whether one should kill adverbs or use them in every sentence. I think the question lies in asking when one should use adverbs. It's just a matter of picking. That's it. In the previous terrible passage I threw together, I used one adverb, which was lately. With the adverb, the sentence would sound like this. Her back got nothing more than the sofa. Not even her husband, who has lately been proposing heroes to get him to work. Without the adverb, the sentence would sound like this. Not even her husband, who has been proposing needles to get him to work. You can see that a selective use of adverbs in this case isn't harmful, nor is it reductive to the quality of your prose. In fact, in this very particular scenario, the adverb does so much for the clarity of the sentence. Unlike what many booktubers seem to be preaching, it's a matter of picking and not burgeoning. Stephen King once said, all I ask is that you do as well as you can. And remember that while to write adverbs is human, to write he said or she said is divine. Use adverbs with responsibility. Buy an adverb condom. Treat the reader as though they are smarter than you. In the passage I have written, I never say that Mrs. Blofart has done anything but head for Nicole's door. I simply gave the reader clues. He unclipped her, no makeup, and bad breath. Also, the dialogue I wrote was not direct. Nicole did not say go F yourself and slam the door. She talked like a real person would and said I will try better. Even though she was really really clearly thinking about the sofa, she still behaved politely. That's called passive aggressive shade. You do not want to spill the beans, you want to imply the beans. Okay, okay, here are some more, okay? No begins, beginning, began, or started. If something is happening, then it had already begun. No need to say he started running, just say he ran. Number two, be logical when it comes to describing a sequence of events. A person cannot say something and drink water at the same time. Do not frog your characters to death. Okay, okay, let's only try beers, alright? Alright, alright. I'm about to drop the goddamn mic. The key to improving your prose is asking yourself how to better convey whatever you just wrote. Good prose is just user friendly. Try to keep that in mind. I post a new video every Monday, so if you enjoyed this one and you want more goodies, click that subscribe button. Don't forget to bash the notification bell. Killing those two makes me very, very, very happy.